Well, hello everyone. I'm Maritza Barone and welcome to my podcast, Things You Can't Unhear. On today's episode, we're going to discover how to live longer. I'm just about to crank over to my next decade and I feel like I'm only just getting started. So I want to be around for a long time and I'm sure you do too. So today we're going to learn all about the lifestyle and environment of the world's longest living people and dig deep into the knowledge of what are now called blue zones. And for those of you who don't know what a blue zone is, they're places around the world where people live the longest and are the healthiest. These were discovered by Dan Butner, a researcher and explorer, a National Geographic fellow and New York Times bestselling author. And today we're going to learn where they are and how we can adopt some of their behaviours. And I have Nick Butner with me, who is Dan's brother and director of community and corporate programs, the Blue Zones Project, which brings the longevity lessons from the world's Blue Zones areas to a larger audience positively impacting the health of humanity. Thanks, Nick, for being with us today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited too, because we can confidently say that most of us would be striving to live to 100 healthily, right? According to research from the National Institute on Aging, if you wake up every day, if you think you live to 90 and you actually want to, it's the number one predictor as to whether or not you will. It's, it's belief. Yes, that's right. Now, can you explain briefly what a blue zone is? I know I, I introduced it briefly in the introduction, but I'd love to hear about your take on it and how the discovery came about. Sure. Uh, 20 years ago, my brother Dan and I um, decided to do a research project based on well, the da- uh, research project called the Danish Twin Studies. It said 80% of how long we live. Um, 80% of how long you live or I live is determined by lifestyle factors and our habits. Mm. Only 20% is genetics. So if that's true, what Dan and I wanted to do is to see if we could find the places around the world where people are living the longest life. Lowest rates of middle age mortality, places where they're reaching 100 at rates 10 times higher than they're doing it here in America. And I think more importantly, they do it with a fraction of the disease because mm. I believe it is about that quality of life, not just the quantity of life. Exactly, because you can live to 100 and you can be unwell, but, and that wouldn't be enjoyable for anyone. But no, nobody you wants 100 that. 100 and you're mobile and you're thriving and you're healthy, then that's what we all want. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So what our thought was if we could go to these communities and we could just keep our mouth shut, listen, Um, we could create a de facto recipe for longevity. Now, what you might heard of that place in Russia where they're drinking about a bottle of vodka every day and smoking a couple packs of cigarettes and they're living to their 150, it's false. Um, We actually went there with demographers that were looking at birth and death records. We went there with uh, physicians. And then we partnered with schools of public health to find the nine commonalities that flew through all the different regions that we found, all the different hot blue zone hotspots, um, found these nine longevity lessons. Mm. Well, before we go through the nine, because I want to go through them in depth so that everyone can and really start to adopt these in their own lives and understand where the longevity comes from, tell us where the blue zones are. So in other words, you want to hear about my vacation? Oh, well, you are lucky enough to have gone to all of them. I'm only lucky enough to have gone to one. So (laughs) the the others are on my list. There you go. Well, the first one that we found was in uh, Sardinia, Italy. It wasn't the whole island, but it was was a small part called the Noro province, where you have the highest rates of male centenarians. Um, Okinawa, Japan, where you have the highest rates of female centenarians. Uh, this little, uh, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, um, where, where um, the middle age life expectancy, if you hit 50, you have a better chance of making it to 100 there than anywhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, an island off the coast of Turkey called Icaria, where they have a fraction of the dementia that we tend to have, um, or the, the, the uh, um, 
uh, the, the, the memory loss that people get in their mid 80s. And then the last one is here in America, it's in Loma Linda, California, where you have the highest percentage of seven day Adventists. I know a lot of people are surprised that America is on the list because it's known for a lot of fast food and, and huge portions. I mean, I've, I've never been, I'm just a, a generalizing and I'm, I'm going there next month. But is that a surprise to a lot of people that California or somewhere in America is on the list? It actually is, you know, because it's about 80 miles from, from LA, you know, and, and it, when you pull into, to, um, to Loma Linda, the first two things you see on the side of the road is a Del Taco and a Wiener Hut. Yeah. You know, now you're in America's blue zone, but as it turns out, they're a culture that is riven, really driven by their faith. They're driven by their faith when it comes to both their um, their diet, which is taken directly from the Bible, but also how they come together as a community to support each other's health. And then lastly, they evangelize health and the healthcare system. So they have this kind of uh, an ecosystem that's brought right into their community. If you look at the health traits that flow through Lowell and Melinda, they tend to be very positive. Mm. Fascinating. So community, which is one that you mentioned there, is one of the power nine, the, the, the common factors that were defined in these studies. Let's go through them if, if you can, um, so we can really iron out what makes these behaviours so powerful. Sure. Um, well, there's nine commonalities and there are lifestyle traits that when integrated into your life, we believe they can make you live longer, be happier. Um, as well, and have less disease. And the first one is, is, is they move naturally. Yeah. Um, we tend to live in a car culture where we need to be driven everywhere we go, but in the blue zone communities, their life was set up to walk to their friend's cellist, to walk to their school, you know, to bicycle to where they want to go, including the grocery store. They weren't a car centric or, they had, their life was set up as inconvenient. So in Okinawa, you're getting up and down off the ground. So built into your life is constant movement that's automatic. What about movement that is not so natural? So we are these days are, are going out and doing marathons and in gyms, pumping iron and really pushing our bodies to extreme levels. Um, and we, much of the time, believe that that is healthy for us and will create longevity in our lives but moving naturally is what you talk about so it's it's not that that real push of strength no i didn't meet anybody who was doing uh, marathons or running triathlons um in my travels but what i did notice is the people you know walking to people gardening which is a yeah. great low impact exercise where you are your heart rate can get up you're getting up and down off the ground um, and kind of moving around. And if you think about it and you look at some of those other activities, though they're really great cardiovascular, what you end up seeing is they're also degenerative to your knees, to your back, mm. to those other things that, that provide a better quality of life as we age. Mm. That's so true because you do see people who have gone through these rigorous exercise routines and struggle later in life. It makes complete sense to move naturally. Now, what's the next number on the, uh, on the power nine? Sure. You know, they, they had, um, the, 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 there's two that we kind of group in with um, together. One is stress. If you look at the Blue Zone communities, they'd have these simple techniques to help reduce stress. That stress is tied to most chronic age diseases. Mm -hmm. You know, as we age, that stress creates inflammation and also kind of those diseases we get when we age. And there are simple techniques. Um, walking with a friend, um, praying with the Adventists, or ancestor veneration in Okinawa. Those intentional things that just kind of let you kind of settle and, and reduce the stress that we tend to have on our daily life. Um, and the other thing is a strong sense of purpose. Um, there was no word for retirement in the communities that we went to. Instead, these are people who could, whether they're 20 or 100, articulate their sense of purpose, that reason they get up in the morning. And as, as research will tell you, people then who can articulate their sense of purpose actually live um, seven years longer. Wow. See, I love that. I talk about having a living with a sense of purpose all the time. And as I believe 
it really is so important to our mental health and our happiness. And now it's beneficial for, for our longevity too. It's like an absolute big win. And I think a lot of us these days, there is a massive shift in society where people are trying to identify their purpose and live with more meaning. So hopefully we are adopting some of these behaviors and this one in particular. Yeah, but I think it's one of the more challenging things for individuals to adapt. I agree. To find, yeah. because you either think that you have your sense of purpose or you don't, but there's an intentional process that you can go through to really, you know, identify what are the things that, that, are, that are really meaningful to you as, as, a, as an individual. You know, what are those things that really kind of make you tick? Um, uh, uh, what are the skill sets that you have? What are the things that you're actually good, good at? What do you want to do? And then is there a way that you can deploy these things back into the community, right? Mm. Because it's wonderful to have these things, but if you can't take them and implement them back into your, into the, into your daily life, then what good is that sense of purpose if you're not living it out? Mm. It's so true. Now, stress is a big thing, obviously, in, in, anyone's life and we want to reduce that as much as we can do you believe people living in blue zones suffer from the same stresses that um more western cultures do no they well they, they well let me put it this way they tend to worry about the same things that you and i worry about mm -hmm. uh, you, they worry about their kids right you know i bet you waking up every morning kind of thinking about worrying and hoping they're healthy they worry about their health mm -hmm. and they worry about how much money they have to be able to do it they have those same things it's just they have these a um techniques to help reduce it and b you know we tend speaking in, uh, for america we tend to to live in these communities we tend to want more and try to kind of financially buy and stress that comes with that financial to have that big house to have that that great job that creates all this extra dress and we try to take on too much as individuals is the default. So how do you set up your life to be able to say, wait a minute, maybe I don't need all this extra stress and I can take that step back and focus on what's important. Um, to give you an example, in, in Loma Linda, California, every Saturday is their Sabbath. They take the day off. Doesn't matter where the kid needs to be driven. It doesn't matter where, where, what the boss is telling them to do. They check out, you know, go to church in the morning. But I think the most powerful one is in the afternoon, they do a nature walk mm -hmm. with their family. They let the stress of the week go and focus on what's important to spend that time with their family, to spend that time with their, lo with their loved ones and really kind of reconnect to those things that really matter oh, that is so so powerful because we just don't do that here we and and that's in australia alone I, i'm talking for we just don't do that to relax to unwind we'll sit in front of a television and watch a show that's probably no good for our mind <laughs> it's yeah yeah so powerful now well, i'll give you one other thing there was in in one of the communities that i was just researching i was working with the community and doing kind of an assessment and in this community in america 47 percent of the people that are living in this community financially are like one flat tire away from not being able to pay their rent and this is a large community in the united states one of the more popular community tourist destinations Amazing. So what kind of stress does that put on you, you know, if, 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 when, you're, when you're that one catastrophic thing away from being able to? So financial is also a big thing that I think we in, 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 in the Western world tend to kind of focus and put too much focus on having that big car or whatever else versus, again, how do you set up your life for that little bit more financial security? Mm. And financial is a, is a huge huge factor in our lives that causes stress now food is another big um a big talking point in your power nine now let's talk about this because food excites me i'd love to eat and i love to eat good food in particular so uh, yeah tell us tell us how food plays a part um three different ways they tended to have a little bit of wine they had a healthy relationship with wine in fact there's a wine in sardinia called cani now that we working with National Geographic, we actually had it tested. And we found out that it had more of those polyphenols, those um, artery scrubbing antioxidants as any other wine. 
So in some ways, it's good for you. And you had a healthy relationship with one or two glasses a day. Um, the second piece is they lived off of a plant-based diet. Um, they weren't vegetarians. They weren't vegans. But they did tend to eat more plants, mm. probably about 90 to 95% plant-based. 90 to Actually, 90 to about 100%. Um, their protein came from beans. They had meat less than, less than four times a month, fish less than three times a week. You know, but what I tend to say to people here in America is we tend to put our plate, when we put our plate and sit down for dinner, that largest portion on our plate tends to be that big piece of, of meat mm. and protein. And the argument I always make is you don't have to get rid of it, but but can't we all agree that putting some more vegetables on our plate is probably a good thing for our health? Absolutely. And then the last thing is, is our caloric intake. You know, if you look at what's happening in our world around our calories and our caloric intake, you know, it's out of hand. Over there, they had these really uh, conscious techniques to help reduce the amount of food that they ate. When they sat down at the table, they pre-plate their foods. They weren't, you know, doing big buffet style meals, for example. Choosing smaller plates is something that I've always, um, well, I've tried to do. Sometimes it's hard because you go back for seconds. But yeah, I think a smaller plate sometimes tricks our minds into thinking that we are eating a larger portion. And then if you wait five minutes after you've eaten it, you're actually full, right? Yeah, yeah. Two, two things tied to that. Um, it, there, it, I've had meals with, with people all over the world. In Okinawa, if you're a centenarian, um, female, before you eat, they'll always say the same three words, hara, hachi, boo, which means I'm only going to eat till I'm 80% full. You know, again, they're thinking about it in their head. So it's a conscious action, which I think is, is just, I think it's so important. Con yeah, consciousness is, is a huge thing, obviously. Um, and that's something that a lot of us these days have sort of lost in, in just a, being, a, you know, evolving. Do you think we've evolved almost too much as a society? I mean, you're talking about things that are here, that are, are powerful, that are sort of what we have just had ingrained in us from centuries ago. So it's, it, do you feel like we may have evolved too much in certain aspects that are... Mm -hmm causing our longevity to be shortened? Yeah, I don't know. Given, given our, our political system here in America these days, I don't know if we've evolved at all. I think we've devolved. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Interesting. No, it's interesting. <laughs> no, I, you know, I think that I th you make over, the human body makes over um, 280 decisions every day tied to your health. And most of them are involuntary. Mm. So it's great to say you need to have individual discipline, you know, to not eat too much. But discipline is a muscle, right? And muscles fatigue. You eventually break down. But when you can't fill up your gas, if fill up a car at a gas station, or walk through an airport, or walk through a grocery store without being bombarded by unhealthy messages. You can't turn on your TV or your social media. These guys have marketing teams that make a lot of money to try to sell you stuff, to try to urge you. If you look at, at some of the food, the processed foods that we eat, there's a lot of money in there to make those addicting, mm -hmm. to make those flavors addicting. So point being, at the end of the day, you know, it, our environment is set up for us to not eat less. Our environment isn't set up for us to eat healthy. It tends to be set up for, for that unhealthy choice. And no matter how much discipline you have, eventually that discipline breaks down and you grab that candy bar or whatever that unhealthy act is for you. It's, just, it's impossible not to over time. I know. And I think, though, if we are conscious of what we're doing and if it does happen every now and then, it's, it's not too bad. But if we're conscious of it and aware that we are not to do that for longevity over a you know, repetitive amount of times, then that, that's the key, I believe, as well. Yeah. You know, I, I think that so we tend to, if you go to a doctor, and I don't know about over there, if you go to a doctor, you know, they're the same system that we've had for healthcare for before we even knew what mm -hmm. cardiovascular disease was. 
you know, before they even came up with that name. You know, you go to a doctor, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. And, and if you're overweight or at risk, it'll say, you need to go on a diet or you need to exercise. But the problem is, is what, they, what they're not paying attention to is behavioral science. Uh, there's a term called hyperbolic discounting. I know I shouldn't eat a Big Mac. I know I shouldn't smoke a cigarette or drink that large thing of soda um, because it's not good for me. But I discount. I do it anyways because at the time I do it, I don't die right away. I can eat a Big Mac every day for 10 years and not die. But the collective impact of that on my body is how you end up getting that disease, right? So we do these things, we do these acts anyways, because at the time we do it, they don't kill us. It's called hyperbolic discounting. Mm. That's why what we know right now is what's more important than even your relationship with your doctor is your relationship with your friends and the people around you. Mm. Those relationships that you have with the places where you work, live, and play, your restaurants, your work sites, your grocery stores, or even the policies or social norms, because that environment around you can actually help you make that healthy choice, the default choice, or the easy choice. That's so true. Community. community is a huge thing, and surrounding yourself with like-minded people is absolutely massive. And they're, they're some of the main factors that are moving through your list, aren't they? Community yeah, those, is probably the, the most I think it's the foundational. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the most foundational to your point. I think you're right on. Um, at the end of the day, the, all, you, there are people that you surround yourself with. In the Blue Zone communities, it was family, right? So, that, so as you age, you're always surrounded by love. And those people that gave you that sense of purpose, the people that helped you get up in the morning, um, they had a strong sense of faith. And we at Blue Zones, huge fans of faith, and we don't care what your faith is. Um, there was two small universities that came out with a study that said people who have a strong sense of faith and show up uh, at least three to four times a month live four to 14 years longer. Mm -hmm. So, so, and those, then the research is done by Duke and Harvard University. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last piece is our friends matter. If your three best friends, according to the Framingham study, are, are um, unhappy or overweight, are, are drink too much or smoke, mm. there's a 150% chance that you do as well. <laughs> so true. That health traits actually flow through a community in the same way a virus does. Now think about that. Are you healthier with that friend that likes to go for long walks and eat plant-based diets? Are you healthier with that friend that likes to go out and eat unhealthy food at restaurants and drink too much every night? You know, so our friends matter. And now I'm pretty sure a lot of your listeners right now are thinking, going, oh, you know what? I need to get this friend out of my life. Before you do that, the other thing that the Blue Zone communities had was um, uh, friends that you could pick up the phone when you're having a bad day and give them a call. And those friends would listen to you. They'd answer the phone and actually be there for you. And we need that in our life. Life is hard. And if you have that support to help you with the challenges that you have on your daily life, it has a huge impact. And that's what, we're ha that's what was happening in the Blue Zone hotspots. I like what you said where, you know, people are probably thinking to get people out of their lives. But you could also be a, an example for your friends and make the changes in your own life for them to follow your direction and, and then start that journey together or continue on that journey together. That's right. Yeah, I think that's, that's really powerful. So belonging is a big thing as well because, um, you know, loneliness can impact us, our health and our mental health in so many ways. Is belonging something that you saw in a, in a religious or a faith way um, when you were on your travels? Well, it was partly the belong, like I said, around the faith. All but two people that we met had a strong sense of faith. Mm, okay. Um, but I think the other piece was around belonging is, um, is when you look at friendships in communities, I think what's really important is for us to think about how do you 
what does that look like? You know, how do, how do you interact as individuals around your friends and communities? What really drives that, those relationships and how do you show up for them? Um, I think that's one of the things that we tend to miss a lot um, as individuals. And there's a lot of things that end up driving our, driving our, our life when it comes to our community. You know, things like, uh, is your community uh, uh, pro-pedestrian? So if you want to walk and do those things that I talked about, is it pro-plans, right? Is it, is it pro-social? When you look at your friends and be, be belonging, I believe that you have to be active in that friendship. You have to be engaged, but you also have to be dependable. You actually have to show up for those friends. Because if you're not, and if they're not, then what could, it, there's research out right now, um, 25 years ago, the average American here in America had three best friends. Now, that number is now down to a friend and a half. According to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, if you have less than three friends, you're defined as lonely. And the impact that that has in your life is about the same as smoking 20 cigarettes a day. Wow. So where does a half come from? Is that something like a social media social friend? Media. Yeah, that's, what I, that's what I'm thinking. It's, it's four, four Twitter friends and three Facebook <laughs> friends equal half. <laughs> oh, wow. So individual will obviously um, is a lot less powerful than community will. That's something that is really evident in what you're talking about. When you come together as a collective and you consciously believe something together, it can be a lot more powerful than if you're standing and doing it alone. Uh, according to research, um, diets and exercise don't work. Only 5% of the population can actually stick with a diet. You know, and I, I, I don't know, you know, your listeners or whatever else, but I can tell you for me personally, I've lost that same 15 pounds about 30 times mm. in my life. You know, sticking with those diets are hard. Sticking with that exercise, or if you look at gym memberships, you start off hot and eventually it just fades away because it's inconvenient. It's, it's hard for us to do that. Or you had that long day of work and you're like, oh, I don't want to do it. But if your environment is set up, with supportive friends, with places where you, where you work, live, and play that nudge you to be a little bit healthier or to do that activity or a culture in your community that allows you to do it, then longevity doesn't have to be something that we pursue as individuals. Rather, it just ensues because of our environment. Mm, absolutely. Now, you're doing your part by the Blue Zones Project to bring this into other communities around the world. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, back in 2009, so Dan and I did our research for about 10 years. 2009, we decided, you know what, we, how do we bring these lessons back to America? Because these communities are never going to be Okinawa, never going to be Ikaria. So what we did is we started with some research from, uh, we, we, we were hired by ARP and National Institute of Aging to find places in the world that were fighting uh, chronic diseases mm. and doing it without the Hawthorne effect. Now, if you don't know what the Hawthorne effect is, is usually what happens is researchers will go into a community and behaviors will change. And as soon as that research leaves, they'll bounce back to be doing the same things that they were doing before they came. Mm. So what they wanted to do is to find uh, pro uh, health projects that were actually changed the health of the population and were able to sustain it over time. And, and we were not able to find any in America. We were able to find only two worldwide, one in Northern France that was fighting childhood obesity and one in this place called North Karelia, Finland, where back in 1974, people were dropping dead of cardiovascular disease, higher rates than anywhere else in the world. 54 years old, dying. These are affluent people just dying. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy who came over to do the project, he, again, new individual and discipline were important, but instead of putting any money on that, what he did is he focused on trying to change that environment to make that healthy choice easier in those areas that I talked about. And what he was able to do is reduce coronary mortality 
in middle-aged men by 80% and sustain it to this day by creating a healthier environment that just nudge you automatically into that healthier stuff. So what we do now is we're working with about 50 communities across the country. Um, looking at how do we look at that area where you live. We spend most of what you do is within about a five mile radius where you work, where you play. And we'll optimize that environment by, by uh, helping you kind of look at your, your house, your living, and how you relate to your family. We, we create um, stronger social networks that break down isolation or create networks where people can come together around healthier activities help people find their purpose. And once they find their purpose, work with volunteering and other work sites to be able to deploy that purpose. Then we go into places where you spend all your time. Most people spend most of their waking hours during the week at the work site. So we work with work sites in the community to basically set up cafeterias, to set up, um, uh, get people up and moving throughout the day instead of sitting at your chair all day, create better options to be able to get to work, better policies, better leadership so people are leading to well-being. Uh, we work with grocery stores. Here in America, last thing you see when you leave that grocery store isn't the healthy choice. It tends to be the soda pop or the candy bars. Mm. So we're working with the grocery store to re-engineer that. So the last thing you see is that healthier choice, better produce, um, grab and goals where things are quick and easy. Work with schools about the kids and restaurants, faith-based partners. Um, and then the last thing that we do and this is told to us by the CDC and from our research, it's the number one most cost-effective way you can impact health in your community is through government policy. Mm. Is your food environment set up, your food system, so that you, everybody has the same access to healthy foods, the affordability to healthy foods? Um, uh, do they have the food skills? Do they know how to prep it? You know, I like to say, you know, I know Brussels sprouts, you know, are good for everyone knows Brussels sprouts are good for you. But if you don't like them, you're not going to eat them. So how do you make them taste good, right? Mm. I look at tobacco policy. And then lastly, how do we look at the designs of our community so that it's easy for us to walk? We're not afraid to allow our kids here in America. Only about 4% of kids walk to school anymore. Back in wow. 1950, it was 72%. So we're engineering that exercise because our parents are afraid to let their kids out on the street. So how do we redesign that community to create trust, to, to allow people to be able to walk, or more importantly, look at our parks and look at how we come together as a community so that we can celebrate around healthy activities. It's, it's almost like you're undoing all the things we've done to ourselves over time. It's just taking it back to basics. That, that's the way that I like, that's the way that I like to see it. I mean, all those things I said in the power nine, I will argue that there's, th these are things that we all learned when we were about um, uh, uh, 10 years old. But again, our environments aren't set up to basically make them a reality. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's very interesting. Now you're, you're coming to Brisbane, Australia next year. What are you doing here and how can we find you? Because I'm sure a lot of people who are listening would love to hear more on this and go deeper into your knowledge and your experience. You no, know, I'd love to. What, I, what I'm doing is I'm coming there. Um, I was offered to do a presentation in late March in Brisbane with the uh, Department of Health to be able to talk about the work. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm showing up with a uh, National Geographic photography to really show the stories of the places that I visited, of the people that I met in those five hotspots around the world that we call the Blue Zones. Um, we I'm going to follow that up with really more in depth around the Power Nine, but then the story as to how we're working in these 50 communities with research-driven, evidence-based work, and how they're right now impacting health. For example, in one community, we worked in childhood obesity in, the, in these communities right outside of LA, about 200,000 people live in there. We've reduced childhood obesity by over 60%. Wow. Yeah, uh, so these, these are having real big impact you know, on the health of our communities. 
Well, so you've... I'm sharing those stories and then I'm offered, I've offered myself up to do a couple more presentations. I just don't know where they are right now. And in some ways, even looking for a partner if they want to bring me in. Yeah, well, if anyone's listening and would like uh, Nick to come and speak in front of their corporation or any of their teams, get in touch. So we can find you at bluezones.com. Is that right? That's right. Or if, you know what, I'll just throw it out there. It's the way I am. My email address is this nick at bluezones.com. Well, if anybody fantastic. wants to reach out to me or whatever, um, I'm, I'm all in. Fantastic. Now, I will, uh, I will get you to answer one last question before we head off. If you could choose from your travels, you've obviously seen a lot, but if you could choose one of these places to, to live or even just to replicate one out of the five, which one stood out to you the most? Um, of, the, of the Blue Zone hotspots? Of the Blue Zone hotspots, yes. So it's, it's, a really, it's a really tough question. Um, I can tell you kind of where my favorite was Ikari off the case, off the coast of Turkey and partly because of the stress and partly because of kind of how that community is set up as a community, as a broader community. But here's one of the problems. These blue zones, we're losing them. In Costa Rica, you're having development come in. In Okinawa, you have the military base and all of those other stuff. You're having Western civilization that are coming in and in some ways kind of um, taking away those, those power nine. And it's one of the reasons why Dan and I are so adamant about, you know, going back to kind of what made those places and the importance of environment mm -hmm. in them. But that's, Ikari is my favorite. And the one that I think is most sustainable is Loma Linda, California. Okay. Well, closer to home, right? <laughs> well, it's also partly because it's rooted in that faith. Yes. Where they're taking everything from their faith and from the Bible that does it. But if you guys, anybody wants a really good vacation and to see one of the blue zones, I always say Icaria, Greece. Um, there's a place called Thea's um, up in the up in the mountain where we which was ground zero for our research um, She's an amazing person wonderful host. I'm not getting paid anything to tell you this But just the environment around her place the views The 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 people and how they come together as a community It was just for me one of more special ground zero my brother Danny or my nephew Actually went over there and got married over there. Oh, beautiful now, a lot of your family's involved in Blue Zones now, aren't they? Um, Dan and I originally did the research, and now my brother Tony is involved in it as well. And I, there's four boys in our family, and this work came out of my brother Dan holds three Guinness Book of World Records for long distance biking, wow. which he did with my brother Steve, the first two with my brother Steve, and the last one with myself and my brother Steve. So we kind of have a family business. That, that family first is something I think we get pretty good. Yeah, I can see that. There's a lot of brothers there too. So it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Well, I love what you're doing. I absolutely am fascinated by learning about Blue Zones and, and the behaviours that we should in, bring into our lives. So thank you again for being part of the show. I, I appreciate it. If there's anything ever I can do, please let me know. And I appreciate um, everything you do. And again, if you want to get in touch with Nick, you can do so via bluezones.com and his email address is nick at bluezones.com. Thank you again. Also, I love to hear from all of our listeners. Let's keep the conversation going. Let me know what you thought of this episode and the fascinating Power Nine topics of Blue Zones. You can find me on Instagram at things you can't unhear and also my personal page at maritza underscore barone. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and review. And remember, be happy, be healthy, be conscious and be kind.